Amen. Um, I think we have some family photos, me and my wife on cue. I want to show you, uh, uh, this is a recent photo. Um, we've been married now for 12 years, and um, we are so, so blessed. So, so blessed. Uh, before I got married, I traveled a lot around the world as a single bachelor, running though just for Jesus. And um, I've clocked three million miles um, before I basically got married, uh, give or take a half a million. Um, and it's been incredible to be able to, so far in 41 years of life, uh, preach the gospel to uh, 10.7 million people face to face in countries that allow me to talk about my faith in Jesus. And out of the 10.7 million, 1.4 million have said yes to Jesus Christ. It's been an incredible journey. And um, I'm so thankful to the Lord that He began the ministry. I also am so thankful to the Lord um, for the team that we do have here at Nick Fee Ministry. COO Jay Smith is in the room at the very front. Victor Arceo at the very front. I want to say uh, there are other team members in the corridors as well. And uh, we're so blessed for the people who do pray for us. We have 500 people who pray for us on a daily basis. And... Um, as, as we stand in front of the gates of hell and redirect traffic, it gets hot a little bit. And uh, my greatest inspiration, though, of all is my wife, Kanae. And um, we, we're madly in love. And um, I, I, I want you to know we're so blessed um, to have a ministry. I'm so blessed that it was in God's will that I would get married. And it was something as a teenager that I never thought possible. I thought, who's going to want to marry me? I can't even hold her hand. Um, I don't need to hold her hand. I just need to hold her heart. And we are so, so blessed uh, with these four beautiful children. This photo was four years ago. And Kiyoshi, he's now 11 years of age. And he just got baptized on the 17th of March this year. And then uh, Dayan, he is now nine years of age. And uh, our twin girls, identical twin girls, um, Olivia and Ellie, um, they're six years old. And Daddy already is the shortest one in the house. Um, I've now been in America for over 20 years. I am a U.S. citizen. Um, and we also know in America that there are over 110,000 children waiting to be adopted in our country. And so me and my wife, we also feel to adopt a baby. We don't know exactly if that baby is going to be an international adoption or an adoption here. But we, we know that the Lord also wants to expand our, our family to five and catch up with Pastor Daniel. Um, I... <laughs> What an incredible story. And to see Mary Beth and Ruth Ann and, and Priscilla and Sarah up here worshiping is just unbelievable. Um, I want to say that um, it is an absolute privilege to speak. I think when you have arms and legs, you take your arms and legs for granted. I want you to know I still take it for granted that I can speak. I want you to know that I am not any more righteous than you. And I'm not more special than you. We know that the Bible says that God loves all of his children the same. We know that not one ministry is more important than another. And we know that it is not what kind of gift of the Holy Spirit you have as much as have you done what God's called you to do. Have you done what He told you to do? Have you stopped doing what He told you to stop doing? And are you continuing on in the things He wants you to continue to do? I was raised in a beautiful home of love, a beautiful home of courage. 
my mother and my father were so courageous. Um, my mom actually was a nurse by profession, and my dad was a cost accountant and in IT um, back in the 1980s. They went to Australia with nothing. My grandfathers were in prison for persecution of their faith. Uh, my mom was in a refugee camp at age six. My dad was in a refugee camp at age 15, and they met each other in Australia. They fell in love, they got married, and five years later, I was their firstborn son. And I said, surprise. And uh, even though my mom's profession was in midwifery in the birth suite, head of all the birth units in a hospital in Victoria, Australia, when it came to her sonograms and ultrasounds, everyone was so excited that they forgot to make sure that I had 10 fingers and 10 toes. And it's by the grace of God that People did not ask. My mom did not ask. My dad did not ask. My mom, though, didn't feel me kick much. And she mentioned it to my father. She said, something doesn't feel right. And when I was born, the doctor said, we are so sorry that we didn't pick this up in the sonogram to give you an option to abort because we don't believe that your son is going to have a quality of life. We are so sorry for this. They said that I would never walk. They said I would never go to school. Well, what is impossible for man is possible for God. Little did they know what I could do with my little foot. I mean, I can now type after two cups of coffee, 53 words a minute, and my little foot enables me to walk and jump and swim. I've done scuba diving, skydiving, surfing, and no one ever knew that their limbless son would travel. 83 countries. 83 countries. And shake the hands of 33 presidents and vice presidents and chief executives of Hong Kong and address 10 different countries, governmental, Congress and House replicas of, of, of the government to allow them to understand that when a woman is pregnant with a disabled son or daughter, that that disabled son or daughter is more than abled in Jesus' name. And that every baby has value. God has a plan for everyone. And some abortion laws were upheld after I spoke to presidents. No one ever could have imagined that I would be used by God to be his hands and feet without arms and legs. That in itself is a miracle. And I'm only here to let you know that I've said yes to Jesus and trusted him one day at a time. And now being 41 years of age, we're talking about me walking with the Lord for 26 years. And when I've been traveling on the road, you know that the spiritual realm is real. You know that witchcraft is real. You know that demonic powers are real. And as we've traveled around the world, we've seen miracles of God, and we've also seen demonic powers at work. And I want you to know that when you know that science can't exactly explain everything, but when you dig deep enough into science, it actually points to a creator, one creator, a designed creation, not from nothing, but from the Creator, one Creator, one above all. And for me, though, in my little brain, as a four or five year old, I didn't know that I had no limbs. I was going to church every week. My dad was a pastor. We went to church, and I sang, Jesus Loves Me. 
Jesus loves all the children, all the children of the world. But then when I went to school, I actually went to school because my courageous mom, by the grace of God, um, overturned a law in Australia to keep disabled children from going to a normal school. And so my courageous mom went to the government and the government changed the law. And I was the first disabled student in the education system of Victoria. <laughs> and when I go on Sundays and I sing that Jesus loves all the children, but then on Mondays I go to school and I see all the children, I'm like, if you love them, God, like you love me, then why did you give them more? And some of these people with arms and legs, they would tease me and pick on me. And I'd come home and I'd say, Mom and Dad, I don't want to go to school because they're teasing me. They're bullying me. Don't worry. God's got a plan for you. You're special. Don't worry about what the world says. And I said, well, what's the plan? They're like, we don't know. But God does. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The next verse says, Then, then you will call upon me, and I will listen to you. He doesn't say, I'll speak back to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says God. What was interesting was me hearing the knowledge that God has a plan. But it takes faith to believe in a God you don't see. It takes faith to believe that it's a good plan when you're crying, when you're bullied, when you're teased, when you're depressed, when you're anxious, and when you're suicidal. And when I asked God, God, what is your plan? And I was seeking him for a while. He didn't get back to me. When we... Know first that God says he has a plan for you. The question is, well, what is it? And will he be so gracious that he could actually share what the plan is? So God, what's the plan? Can you turn me down a little bit? Thanks. What's the plan? And he didn't come back to me. I leave a voicemail. He didn't come back to me. I gave him suggestions of a plan. He didn't come back to me. I gave him plan B, C, D, E that he can choose if he wants. But it was all about God. What's the plan? Who would like to know God's plan for their life? We all would like to know God's plan. But what's interesting is on this side of heaven, if God taught you and showed you all the plan and he gave you a booklet on every single minute of every single day of your life, first and foremost, you would die of being overwhelmed. Second of all, then you don't act in faith because you know what's happening the next second. On this side of heaven, the pinnacle relationship that God has with human beings is faith. And I didn't have any. And when I didn't have any and I didn't hear from God, I concluded my own conclusions, which actually were very false. When you don't know the truth of your value, you're going to start to believe the lies of your value. When you don't know the truth that God has given you a purpose, an eternal life, His grace, His strength, His joy... And his peace that the world cannot give or an accounting firm, P&L, business, success, or a measure of philanthropy or a joy of getting married and having kids. There is a peace and joy that Jesus gives you that the world and no other human relationship nor any tangible thing can ever give you. 
Money, drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, fame, and fortune. If you put your happiness in temporary things, your happiness will be temporary. Some of you are doing everything in the Christian walk exactly like God's telling you to do. Do good, do well, get married, have kids. But you, and you go to church, but you still don't know the joy of the Lord. If you're single and you don't know the peace and joy of Jesus, let me tell you, don't get married thinking that that's going to change. Because if you ain't happy with Jesus while you're single, you ain't going to be happy married. Does that make sense? And so we need to know who is this Jesus on a one-to-one, not as an accessory where you text him only when you need him. For me, I was very foolish at age eight. And I said, God, here's the line. I draw the line. And you owe me an explanation as to why. Because all I see is that I'm bullied and I'm going to be bullied for the rest of my life. I'm alone and I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I will never have a job. I will always be a burden to my parents. What's the point? I might as well just give up. And at age 10, I attempted suicide in six inches of water in my bathtub. And as I, at age 10, am choking while I'm inhaling water to end my life because all I saw were broken pieces ahead, all I could see was brokenness, all I could feel was brokenness, and I had no faith to feel or see anything other than the tangible and the physical and the now, I was stopped by one thought. And it was seeing in my mind my mother and my father crying at my grave, wishing they could have done something more. And it was at that moment where I realized I don't want to leave them with that pain. So by the grace and mercy of God, I decided to stay. I was depressed until age 12. And at age 13, I played soccer. And I was on the field having fun. And my friend kicked the ball to me. Long story short, I hurt my foot so bad I couldn't walk for three weeks. And I was in bed staring at the ceiling realizing I have a choice. Either to be angry for what I don't have or be very thankful for what I do have. And at age 15, I radically had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Radical. And do you know how radical it was? It was at a Bible study in a church. And I was reading with them, 30 of us, John chapter 9. No one told me about John 9. I read it in a group setting. And I'm like, wow. It was a story about a man who was born with a disability with no sight. And people were asking Jesus, why was he born that way? Was it because of his parents' sin? What does that mean? That God would punish the parents because of their sin? No, Romans 6.23 says that if God punished us for our sin, we would die. Because the wages of sin is death. Now, yes, there are a lot of scripture and correct doctrine that when you obey the Lord, when you abide in him, he abides in you. And if you do what he wants you to do and live the way he wants you to live, knowing you'll never be perfect, but you strive and hunger to be who he wants you to be every day, his shadow of protection is over you underneath his wing. And when you deliberately disobey God, God actually might send you or move his hand away from you because you walked away. And he might call America in a way without God's protection because we asked God to leave the education system. We didn't ask him. We kicked God out of the education system. 
We kicked God out of the government. And if you know the history of our forefathers in America, this ain't political. It's very simple. Read Deuteronomy 28. When a nation blesses God, God blesses a nation. Can you hear an amen? And so when we know that, we know that it's not about your works today. Now, we know that God can bless you. But some of the people out there as well saying, well, come to Jesus, give a lot of money, and God's going to bless you. Or you have a broken car, oh, that's just a faith test. Give away your broken car, and then God will give you a new car. It's this fake gospel where just do good, Bless God, and God will absolutely heal you of cancer. God allows Christians to sometimes die of cancer. Can I hear an amen? I'm sorry if you don't believe it, but I know a lot of Christians who had their walk with God, who loved God with all their heart, and they were taken home through cancer. If I don't go home through cancer, I'll go in a car crash. I'll go in a plane crash. I've had a grenade at my house with a pin. Pick any way that you want me to go. It doesn't matter. The Lord is the one that holds that card in how I go and when I go and not a minute before and not a minute later. Let me tell you, it's precisely when the Holy Spirit wants me to go. And when I talk to someone and they're dying of cancer, I can absolutely believe for their healing with all my heart. I have two pairs of shoes in my closet in case God gives me arms and legs. One for running and one for dancing. Period. And I can sit them down and believe with them with all my heart. But what's interesting is people don't realize that it's, it's their neighbor and it's their mother who don't believe in Jesus, and if I say God for sure is going to heal you of cancer, but they die of cancer, what does that mean for the mother who buries the child who absolutely felt that they should have gotten healed? We're going to believe for your miracle, and guess what? The greatest miracle of all is heaven. So until you take your last breath, we know that heaven's waiting for us. And that's where our hope is, and that's where our treasure is. Can you hear an amen? It's the ultimate healing. But I will believe with you that your cancer goes. A hundred percent, I will fast with you that your cancer goes. But I will tell you that sometimes full believing Christians die of cancer, and it's okay because only God knows how we go. And so when we know this, we know the blessing of God's plan. We don't know God's plan. But they asked Jesus a second question about the man who was born blind. Is it because of his sin that he was born that way? Do you not want to know that, what that is? Reincarnation. Was it that in his previous life he sinned and then was cursed with this next life being born blind. I was 13 years old. I was in an Australian airport, and this woman came up to me, and she said, were you born this way? I said, yes. She said, do you know why? I said, I don't know why. She said, would you like to know why? I said, I would love to know why. She said, well, let me tell you why. I said, okay, I'm all ears. She says, in your previous life, you were a very bad boy. And she's for real. And I'm like, I'm 13. I'm like, what? Like, in my previous life, like, I don't even have fingerprints to this life. I don't understand how she tracked me at all if I don't even have fingerprints. And, and, and she said, but don't worry because you're a good boy, right? And I'm like, Because now that you're a good boy, you're going to come back in the next life like a butterfly. And I'm thinking, that sucks. Why would I want to be a butterfly? Do you know how many butterflies I've killed in my wheelchair? I do not. I refuse to be a butterfly. And then to become a butterfly without knowing last life, with me now knowing this life, but not knowing last life, not leaving, not learning anything, not progress. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. 
And Jesus said, absolutely not true. No. Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. <laughs> Jesus spits in the dirt, makes a clay, puts it on the blind man's face, and the blind man sees. What was so amazing to me was not another miracle. What was so amazing to me was the faith of the blind man. Can you imagine? You're blind. And you hear a question, why was he born that way? It was done so that the works of God would be, would be revealed through him. And then someone comes with muddy, dirty fingers and puts it on my face. I'd be like, hey, stop, stop, stop. Time out. I don't want a facial. Who are you? We would be asking, who are you? What are you doing? What do you want? Tell me what the plan is. And then I will tell you if I trust you. Isn't that interesting? It is the pinnacle on this side of heaven to have faith that he says what he says. He means what he says. He says what he means. And God is not a God to lie. He cannot lie. So when you read Romans 8.28, all things come together for the good for those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. Guess what? It's true. Try him. He can take your broken pieces and do something beautiful. Beautiful. And your history is his story. For as long as you're breathing, your story ain't done yet. He's got the pen, not you. If I had the pen, I would have given Nick, if I had the pen, arms and legs at age eight. Wow, 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 how much I would have missed out on. By God giving me arms and legs at age eight, going on TV, and maybe you see it on TV, how many people have actually been changed completely by witnessing a miracle on TV? No one. But I stand before you as a miracle of God that you cannot argue with. And I get in front of presidents, 33 of them, and in front of crowds as large as 800,000 people, and 400,000 people at a time give their life to Jesus Christ. It's a miracle of God that God has a plan. He's got a plan, a really good plan. And he ain't going to shortchange you. Philippians 4.13 you can endure all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen? So when you seek him and you haven't found him, here's some advice. Keep looking and you'll find him. Keep waiting. His time is perfect. He is not a God to play hide and seek. I am so glad that at age 15 I met Jesus. And I said, Jesus, heal me of my greatest disability, sin. Shame, guilt, condemnation, addiction, death. You want a disability? What about death? What a curse? Death. Let's start there. Forget about arms and legs. Who cares? Arms and legs, 90 years. Who cares? 90 years compared to billions of years as an introduction to eternity? Yes, I started stock market trading, invested at age 16. I went into options trading at age 17. I went into real estate at age 19. I did a Bachelor of Commerce in Financial Planning and Accounting, double major, graduated 21. Retired my parents in 2011. Yes, praise God. But I'll tell you, never believe that we could preach the gospel to 750 million people by age 41. In 
And you want to know why it's so beautiful not to be physically healed? Because I believe that not everyone gets physically healed. And because of that, this is what I tell people. When you don't get a miracle, ask God how you can be one. You want to get out of depression? Five ways. You can't pray out of depression. Not all the time. You can't read enough word of God to get out of depression. A part of it is actually to go help someone else in need. A part of it is to actually go and talk to someone about your problem, and it's called counseling. And that's why I love, I feel the sense of family. And I'll tell you right now, when you go through a brokenness at home, when you go through a brokenness in your life, some of us can get saved and know the Word of God, but still have a broken heart because no one asked me, what did I go through? And just to be a family is a gift. Being in a church is a gift. Me to have brothers in my life, I can ask the hard questions and they ask me the hard questions. And some of us teenagers in this country are foolish, very foolish, thinking that we can call ourselves Christians but be sexually active before we get married, saying the F word and bullying people even in our youth group. We don't know the Lord. And I'll tell you right now, we need to know the Lord. And in every day, we need to ask God three questions. Can I have Sam play some keys up here, please? I play keys, but I'm not warmed up yet. The three questions that I ask Jesus. Jesus, what am I doing that you want me to stop doing? Jesus, what am I not doing that you want me to start doing? And Jesus, what am I doing well that you want me to keep on doing? Isn't that what we not do for our businesses? Why not do that with our marriages? Why not have that intent? Church is church. It's awesome. I love church. God bless every pastor. Absolutely. My dad was one of them. But if I invite someone to church and they say no, are you still going to preach the gospel? Well, I invited them to church. They must not be interested. Wrong. Ask them, what can I pray for you for? Oh, no, they would never tell them. Oh, they might. Well, I don't know how to really connect with them. Will you make time to share your testimony to a stranger? Well, how do I do that, Nick? Take them to a coffee store or have them over at your house and say, hey, I'd like to share my story. And you share your story, not out of pride, but glory to God. You don't get beheaded yet in America to preach the gospel. So while the window's open, guess what happens after you share your story? They say, I'd like to tell you mine. Do you know how much hurt there is in the world? I only know a tiny, 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 tiny little bit. And information that general public never knows, never will know. We've got a pretty good pulse on the nations for the last 20 years. Pretty good pulse. And it's overwhelming. And all I can do is Ephesians 6 to put on my armor and have feet ready to move. Do you know what feet ready to move is? You ain't laying down, you ain't sleeping, and you ain't sitting. You're ready to move like a race. And you're going to run as if there's one prize. Because all I need to finish today 
is today. And when I stand, that in itself is arising. Nick doesn't shine. Not him, but Jesus in him. And when you have armor on, you can't shine from within. You could be illuminated, whatever. You want to know what, though? I make sure that there are no chinks in my armor, and I'm polishing up my armor so when they look at me, they're blinded by the righteousness of God that's reflected. There's only one God that lives in me, illuminates through me, and I reflect His glory. It ain't Nick. It's not His intelligence. It's not His discipline. It's not His... It's Jesus. Only Jesus. One in five men are addicted to pornography. One out of three girls have been sexually abused by age 17. One out of five boys in America have been sexually abused by age 17. 67% of all teenagers have produced explicit imagery of themselves. 67% in America. The average time on tech, on iPad, on phone, seven hours and a half per day. Parents, let me give you a piece of advice. Stop giving your children everything they want, when they want, how they want it. Stop it. And don't apologize to tell them to get off that technology. Teenagers, listen to your parents. They mean well. They're not the best. Neither were mine. I headbutted my dad a couple times. He headbutted me a couple times. We don't get along. A couple years. Man, was he strict. I got the belt. I got the belt. Not grounding. Belt. Do you understand? Do I belt my kids? No, I don't belt my kids. Am I telling your parents to belt you up? No, I'm not telling your parents to belt you up. But listen very carefully. Discipline is good. Be disciplined. Honor the Lord. And for as long as you're under the house of your parents, honor your parents. They're not your little God. God's your God. Trying to figure out who are you and honor God and honor your parents. I can't figure that out. But you need to get on your knees with prayer and fasting. And God will show you what He wants you to do. Today, I'll tell you right now, God has a plan for you. Tonight, He has healing for you. Tonight, He has redemption for you. And tonight, if you breathe your last breath, I know where my car is. I know we're going home. But I don't know if I'm going to make it. Does anyone guarantee me I'm going to be able to get up on the 635 and north on the 75 and get off the freeway healthy and no car crash and no death? No one, no one can guarantee me life. And guess what? When you know you're already eternally living, it doesn't matter when you go and how you go. And that is called peace. When you know the truth of your value, that you are wonderfully and fearfully made, that you're a general in the army of God, a child of God, that when I pray, when I pray, angels move. When I pray, angels move. When you pray, angels move. You may not feel anything, but there's angels that move when you pray. I fast from food because there, the Bible shares you can pray all you want all day long. But if you don't all 
so fast, there's still some things that will never happen. Where does that say? Go look it up. There are some things that sometimes you got to fast. Yes, angels move, but the spiritual realm is way above us. How God is in His ways and His thoughts, way above us. That's why you got to read the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, you are not standing on the rock. You got to know the word. And not just, oh, I feel the Lord wanting this. Read the Bible. Go back to the Bible. Get rooted. Because a tree, when it has no root, when the wind comes, phew, you can have a million people pray for you. But if you don't pray, and if you don't seek, and if you don't ask someone for accountability from your pornographic addiction, it's your responsibility. It's back on you. Here's the good news, ready? Every addiction can be broken in Jesus' name. Every loneliness can be healed in Jesus' name. And when you know Him and you know you're standing on the rock, you can humbly, boldly, confidently stand, arise, and shine and give God all the glory. Right now, from the front to the back, if you know, do we have any overflow room with people in the other? All right. Do they, obviously they have a screen. Would they know how to get here if I told them? Good. Can we open up those three double doors, please, and open up all the other doors, please? Listen very carefully. Everyone say very carefully. Everyone say very carefully. I want you to very carefully listen. I believe that around 90% of all of you already know Jesus Christ as Lord and your Savior. And you know that if you happen to die in your car on the way home, God forbid. We're good with just piano, but you can play too, I guess, if you want. But I love you. Give me a hug. We don't need the band yet. No band. Sorry, sorry. Give me a hug. I'll call you up. Give me a second. Give me a second. Sorry for any miscommunication, or maybe you saw my hand signals. I didn't tell you properly. But listen very carefully. About 90% of the people here know that if this was your last night, you know where you're going. Okay? Cool. If I don't see you again here, I'll see you up there, all right? It's going to be amazing. Can't wait to give you a hug with my arms. I love you too. You want to know how much I love you? This much, you can't see my hands. You understand me? Listen. What I want to do are two things real quick. There are some of you who don't know Jesus Christ. There are some of you that think you're too young to give your life to Jesus Christ. There are some of you who come to church and have been coming to church for 10 years. But you know you're not walking with Jesus. You're not abiding in Him. If I looked at you at school and I heard what came out of your mouth and you're not filtering what's really happening in every thought, in every... I'm not asking if you're holy. No one's holy. But to strive to want to please Him because He died for you. He died on the cross for you. 
He died on the cross for me. Now I live for him. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And right now, all across this room, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, in a moment, you're going to stand and you're going to come forward. And you're going to kneel on these steps. If you already know who Jesus Christ is, you're not moving forward. Are you with me? Some of you say, no, no, no. I need to stop saying this. I need to stop doing this before I say yes to Jesus. I need to become better. That's a lie. Jesus didn't come for the healed and the polished and the righteous. He came for the broken, the oppressed, the afflicted. He came for the sinner. He came for the addicted. He came for us who are broken. And don't let the devil try to convince you that you need to become a little bit more acceptable to God before you move forward. It's a lie. Come as you are. Lean not upon your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. And in this act of faith, it's you saying, God, I trust you. Despite what I feel, despite what I tangibly see, and all I know are broken pieces in my life, I want you. I want your plan, not my plan. I want your strength, not my strength. I want your peace not the world's peace. I want you. I want your power. When they got to want to come up there alone, here's a trick. You simply turn to the person next to you and say, hey, I really want to go up there. I really want to share that, that moment with Jesus at the front and say that prayer, but I don't want to go alone. Will you come with me? They'll say yes. So right now, from the front to the back, if you know you need to give your life to Jesus, I want you, if you already know Jesus, you're not standing. Do you understand? You're praying right now. But if you don't know who Jesus is and you don't have that salvation and you want to walk in that relationship with Jesus, I want you to right now stand and come forward right now. We're going to wait for the first person. Don't wait for the first person. Be the first person. And if you see someone standing, come on down. I want you to clap them on down. I'm going to wait. You don't know who Jesus is. Well, you know you need to stop playing church. and You need to really make your life right with Him. Stand right now and come forward. Right now. Let's clap. You don't have to kneel, you can stand. I'm waiting for more people. Come on down, young people. There we go. Are you coming on down? Clap them on down. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, come on, anybody else, get up, 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 in Jesus' name, just get up, just get up, stand and come, stand and come, anyone else, keep coming, hallelujah, I'm going to wait, I feel there's more, I'll wait. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Come on, there's more of you. Stand and come. I'll give you five seconds left. Any young people? Five, four, th three.
Hallelujah. Can we all close our eyes? If you're up the front, please repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I thank you for loving me. I am a sinner and I do not deserve heaven. I'm a sinner and I deserve death. But Jesus, you died for me that I could live. And I thank you, Lord, that you do have a plan, a good plan. And I ask you today to give me faith to believe in the Bible and all of your promises. I'm so sorry of everything I've done wrong. Forgive me. Transform me and help me to walk away from all that is wrong. Heal my heart. Renew my mind and help me to know you. Show me how to live. Teach me how to pray and to trust you each and every day. When I fall, when I fail, give me strength and faith to know you're always with me and you'll carry me through it all. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Right now, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, awesome.